Okay, th this is a quite unusual circumstance here, but in the huddle is trying to play matchmaker, JB, and uh, we're not playing matchmaker in the Tinder sense. Uh, we're playing it no, in no. something much different. Why, why don't you get people up to snuff here because you've been semi-involved as well uh, with what is going on with our coach's interview here. Yeah, well, um, you know, to, we wanted to bring him back onto the show. One of the big marquee games of, of uh, week four was uh, Frostburg State against Rowan. Uh, both teams coming in undefeated. Uh, the Bobcats had to cancel their game due to the threat of the of Hurricane Florence uh, with Christopher Newport. There was some back and forth on whether that would be rescheduled, but we saw um, last weekend, Frank, that, that they now effectively have an open date on September 29th. I, uh, I ran it by um, Coach and my alma mater, Hobart, to see if something could be put together there. Uh, fortunately, the short notice apparently was not something that the folks in Geneva could, could handle. But I know that, uh, that, that Coach uh, Fitz and, and his team are willing to play and they want to play, so maybe we can help them out. Uh, but for the most part, what we really want to do is kind of catch up with the number six ranked Frostburg State Bobcats and head coach Delane Fitzgerald. Coach, congratulations on a big win uh, yesterday against a pretty tough rowing team. You guys were, were battling out there for a while until you pulled away late. James and Frank, thank you. It's been a good start to the season. Very interesting start to the season with the breaks that we've had between games. Well, let's uh, kind of uh, get into uh, where let's talk Rowan first. Let, let, let's get uh, yesterday's game out of the way. Let's do that. Um, so, you know, you, you got a team in Rowan that's uh, defensively shown themselves to be a little bit of a juggernaut over the years and a little bit this season as well. How did you prep for that team? Did, did you change anything up uh, as you approached them? And what was the difference maker in your mind? Where, where, at what point in that game did you finally say to yourself, yeah, we, we've cleared them. We, we've got this one in the bag. I'm a head football coach, so I never think we've got this one in the bag. Not not until the clock reads all zeros. Uh, Frank, this is what happened to us at this offseason. We had nine months to get ready for Stevenson. And then we come off of that game, a Thursday night game, and we have nine days to get ready for TC and J. And then we come off of that game, and we actually prepped for Christopher Newport for three days until we were canceled by Hurricane Florence. So then we had nine or ten days to get ready for Rowan. Well, everybody says you had a lot of prep time to get ready for Rowan, but as a coaching staff, you get scared of this. We haven't gotten into a rhythm yet. We, we haven't gotten into a football schedule yet and had a normal football week. So we didn't know what to expect from our young men yesterday. And we were, and you said it, you know, we were battling there early in the first quarter. We were sluggish. We were sluggish and not being ourselves and not playing great in the first quarter. And then we seemed to catch our second win and, and all the guys looked around and they were, oh, this is what we're supposed to do. This is who we are. And we played pretty well second, third, and then early on in the fourth quarter. And, and then with the game being 34 to seven, some of our backups got to play late in that fourth quarter. You know, we saw this with yeah, uh, St. John Fisher uh, yesterday to a certain degree, not to cut you off, James, but they hadn't played a game uh, since the 1st of September. Uh, until they faced Ithaca yesterday, and they came guns a blazing in the second half. But you wonder what would have happened if they actually had more gelling on the field. Uh, let's say uh, from a game on the fifteenth of September or something like that. It's amazing how schedule in the early season can really affect a team positively or negatively. And JB, I, I cut you off, so go ahead. Well, going back to what Coach was saying about the the sluggish start. Well, on one hand, you could say that. You didn't get off too sluggishly because you got the 68-yard touchdown pass from uh, from Connor to, to Malik to kind of get things going. But then your defense, you know, turned you know, gave up a long pass there, and you guys were actually trailing heading into the second quarter. It looked like though it was really that that punt block um, that was returned for a touchdown that gave you guys the 27 halftime lead. Kind of maybe was that the spark that sort of woke your team up a little bit or. Uh, where did you see the the tide of that game go from being more of a defensive struggle to one where your where your team started to take control? Yeah, two two straight games. Uh, Malik Morris took the football off the punter's foot uh, against TC and J. Not sure if you guys got to see the highlight clip of that, but one one of the prettier plays, uh, more special athletic plays that I've had in my career here. But he actually took it off his foot and ran it in without the ball ever touching the ground against TC and J. Well, he turned around yesterday and took the ball off the punter's foot, and then the ball bounced around the back of the end zone a couple times, and Malik ended up jumping on it for the touchdown. Um, James, to answer your question, 
I, I thought that was when our guys kind of relaxed and, and were able to, to, to be closer to their best selves. Well, uh, we did play that clip because uh, when Delane Fitzgerald puts a uh, clip on Twitter and says, this is one you got to see, essentially, in the huddle listens, okay? Uh, we, we've That's told right. you that. We, we listen to you, Coach. Uh, we, we're ready to run through the wall for you at any given time. And right. it seems like your team is in that position to do that at any given time as well. You have had such great success over the last couple of years. Uh, you know, you continue to dominate uh, a lot of uh, teams. Even if you struggle out of the starting gate, you eventually get your separation like you did yesterday, 34-7, to I think was the final, as it says on the screen. But now you start getting toward the meat of your season uh, in terms of the schedule. We'll talk about next week in a moment a little bit more, but uh, let's talk about a couple weeks down the line and what is following. You still have Wesley, you still have Salisbury, you still have some other uh, NJAC teams to go up against. From what you've seen, how does the NJAC line up this year, especially with a team like Wesley that's playing with a lot of spirit for obvious reasons with Coach Strass's passing? Uh, Salisbury, that seems to be uh, kind of resurgent too. And even, you know, look, any given NJAC team, it seems like, wants to take uh, a team out, and you got a bullseye on you. So give us your kind of broad view of what you, you're up against in the NJAC schedule coming up. Yeah, we, we've got a bye week this week. So, again, we're not getting on schedule. Two weeks from now, we play Wesley. Uh, Wesley's one of the top ten, maybe one of the top five teams in the country this year, as they are most seasons. Um, that game was really, really good last year. We, we lose in overtime um, in a game that we had an opportunity to win. Both teams had an opportunity to win the game several times in the last 15 minutes and one team would make a play and another team would make a play. I expect the same thing two weeks from now. At great football games. Just going to be a good football game at their place. Um, you have to forgive me because I am old school head coach and I don't look ahead a lot. <laughs> I'm not sure who we play after Wesley. Um, but, but I should know these things in our conference and, and, and early on the, the way it looks. It, it, it's us and Wesley and Salisbury and it, it's a free team race in the NJAC. I would say this because too many people have already counted them out. Montclair State's better than people think they are. Uh, Rowan's going to oh, yeah. win some more football games this year because they got good football players. Um, but that, that, that's kind of the way I see it going down the stretch. William Patterson's after Wesley, just so you know. So uh, you get Wesley and then William Patterson. We just checked on that, but just make sure. And, Dust and D Dustin Johnson, their new head coach, is doing a good job at William Patterson. I, I got to watch them. I got to watch their game live on the internet two weeks ago, a week ago. Uh, they're 100% better than they were a year ago. So good for him and good for that university. So, JB, are you going to ask him about next week or uh, what are we going to do here? Well, like I said, I tried to help out. Uh, didn't didn't quite pan out, and I know that the coach has been you know, dialing a few other you know, schools around. But I guess, coach, kind of walk us through you know the what, what's the what's the process like? I mean, when you know, I imagine was it your athletic director, your president, to kind of let you know that you know with the with the approach of the hurricane. I mean, this is a pretty rare occasion. Um, you know, maybe not so much in, in, of late in the last couple of years, because since we had a hurricane here in Florida last year, but. Um, kind of walk us through this process like how do you you know you're starting to get ready for a game then you find out that you can't have one and then you, you, know, you realize you have this open date I mean what's it like for a head coach when all these sort of you know changes come flying at you I felt all week like I had lost a distant relative or or that I'd lost a pet that, that, that you know the wife and the kids really really liked but you were just okay with but there was a little bit of an empty <laughs> feeling all week when we canceled the game because we yeah. want to play um, more so than our coaching staff want to play. We've got 123 young men now in this football program that would really like to play football each Saturday. But to answer your question, our administration here is great. President Ronald Nowacek does a great job, and our athletic director, Troy Dell, does a great job. Um, they were proactive with the hurricane approaching and communicating with Christopher Newport. And then we ended up finding out on Tuesday evening. So we went Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and we were looking towards Christopher Newport, and they tell us on Tuesday evening, that, that there's no game. Um, yeah, uh, depression's a real strong word, uh, but maybe maybe a light depression in our football program because you only get in NCAA Division three football, you're guaranteed 10 opportunities. And now we have to walk in a room and tell all of our players we're going to get nine opportunities this fall. Well, her for hey, anybody out there watching, we have a bye week on Saturday, and our football <laughs> motto right now is have ball, we'll travel. 
we've got a football right. here and we've got a football program that'll travel we'd love to play saturday yeah i was just going to say first off the hurricane uh was no depression that's for sure uh so at least everybody did take it seriously uh it led to your depression maybe a little bit but uh, look, he's serious, folks. He uh, is willing probably to take any takers up to maybe even Tuesday morning if it got down to where, or let's say Monday by 3 o'clock uh, type of scenario. So if you know your program, uh, as even a fan, has an open date on this Saturday and you're watching this, hey, call your athletic director if you have any kind of input in it and say, why not? Uh, we can host and uh, there's a chance for a game. It would be great to see Frostburg get a 10th game. It would be great to see a team that wouldn't normally play Frostburg get a chance. That leads me to another question, though. As I say, teams that wouldn't necessarily play uh, Frostburg, Coach, um, where are you going after this year? What's going on here? I, did, did we, like, scare you away? Uh, did, I mean, in the huddle premieres, we go to East Region last year. We think we have a great relationship with you. And then suddenly, yeah, see you, JB. See you, Frank. We're, we're going to Division Two. Yep, yep. So walk us through this, Coach. I, we had heard the rumors all last year. It came to fruition, obviously. Next year, you begin your Division Two schedule. Uh what exactly happened? Was it a football-related issue? Was it a department-wide issue? Take us through it. First things first, the only way it's ever see you goodbye is if you guys tell me to quit calling and quit emailing and quit texting you. Um, <laughs> okay. you we we won't do that. We won't do that. <laughs> yeah, you've got a friend for life here in Frostburg, and then you got a football program that thinks really, really highly of what y'all are doing. So appreciate everything. But, yeah, we're not going anywhere on that one. On the transition of our football program from Division Three to Division Two, the, the education that I've gotten in the last year on this is it starts in the political circles. We're, we're a state of Maryland University, so it starts with politicians and, and what people downstate and what people in the entire state of Maryland would like to see. Um, and, and then it goes to the administration, and the decisions and all are made way before it gets to my desk. Um, I had little to no input on our change from division three to division two. And to be frankly with y'all, I, I would prefer not to have any input on it. Um, they, they, they pay me and, and they've asked me to mentor the young men in our football program and, and to be the front porch of the university and to do a great job at what we're doing, which is the education of young men. And, and that's my job. Whatever level uh, our state and our administration chooses for us to play, that's a level I'm going to coach at. I'm going to do the best possible job that I can do. Coach, though, I remember when uh, SUNY Albany moved up to uh, Division I uh, back in, I believe it was 1997 or thereabouts, uh, or that was when the process began for them, and they played Union. They had some division, I think they went uh, transitional up to two, then to one uh, in some way, but they did have, let's say, those Correct. Division One type athletes back when on their team, the last time they faced Union and Union won or lost that game rather, fifty-four to zero. It was a surprise. But then we look at who they've got on the field, and obviously Albany was planning. Now a lot of people are going to try to claim that Frostburg has had time here to prepare for Division Two, so they've got some Division Two type studs on the field uh, at this point. Has that filtered through yet in terms of your recruiting for who's on the field right now, or is it more or less? Still your Division Three team, and that whole Division Two thing starts up next year or while you're recruiting for next year right now. Take us through that aspect of it. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot slower process than I want it to be as a football coach. Um, we, we have no Division Two players, and our Division Two process hadn't started. We don't even make application into NCAA Division Two until February. We have a conference to go into, the Mountain East Conference, which is a great Division Two conference. And we have, we have a t tentative schedule for 2019, but we don't make application in the NCAA Division II until February. And if we're accepted, we officially become an NCAA Division II member on July 1st, 2019. And I hope in 2019, we're gonna have some Division II players on our roster. And I hope we're gonna be offering athletic aid and be moving forward in, in that part. And we should already be doing that, but we haven't yet. Um, but I hope that we're going to have some Division II players. But Frank and James, we're playing with NCAA Division III players and going to be playing with a lot of NCAA Division III players the next couple of seasons. Yeah, that, and that there's a lot of those. Uh, everybody wants it to be. 
<laughs> yeah, that, that answer is not what everybody wants it to hear, but that's that's the honest truth. Well, you, you've got some pretty strong Division three players, including your quarterback, Connor Cox, who's off to a great start. Uh, one of the guys that we had a chance to meet with uh, last season, Niall Scott, is uh, had made it to the big leagues. He's in the NFL uh, with the San Francisco 49ers. I've seen him in a few preseason games. And, you know, uh, I imagine he was in contact with you throughout that whole process. And, uh, of, of, you know, I get basically being like an un undrafted free agent and you know, getting the call from the 49ers. Have you been in touch with Niles? How's he doing out there uh, on the other side of the country? Yeah, N Niles and I speak weekly. Um, Niles was cut two weeks ago by the San Francisco 49ers, and he signed the following day or two days later with the Denver Broncos, talking about his preseason games. And, and my memory could be slipping me, but his um, the game that he played the best in, in, in the preseason was against the Denver Broncos. And then as soon as San Francisco cut him, they signed him. And, and he's living his dream. He's living his childhood dream right now. And we're really, really happy for Niles. Um, what, what a hardworking young man, and he made himself a professional player. You mentioned Connor. Connor's a four-year starter here for us and has done a real nice job in our football program, and we're happy to have him as good or better than, than any quarterback in NCAA Division Three right now. And then the yeah. other one that, that no one's talking about is Malik. Malik Morris is playing yeah. as well on offense and special teams as anybody in the country what? right now. He's been overlooked the first two years of his career. Great football player. Another position that often gets overlooked, Coach, and we got to be introduced to a couple of your uh, offensive linemen. You had two really uh, great guys on your left side of the line, and I know they graduated last season. Uh, tell us about the, the, the newcomers, the ones that are, you know, that are, that are stepping up and filling in. Uh, they are doing such a good job protecting Connor and, and the backs. Yeah, we lost Jake Towson and Christian Walsh last year, and Jake Towson was a two- or three-time all-conference player, and Christian Walsh was an All-American last year for us at left guard, and they both graduated and moved on to bigger and better things. Um, it's nice to hear from them and see them every once in a while. Christian Walsh is a high school football coach, so we're really, really happy <laughs> for him and, and happy of, yeah, happy for the young man that he turned out to be. He's the offensive line coach at Leonardtown High School in Leonardtown, Maryland, so good for him right now. Right. Filling their spot. Uh, Wade Olson has filled in at left guard, and then Eugene Robinson has filled in at left tackle, and we have Jason Money rotating in with those two young men, so we've kind of used a platoon system. To, we took three players to replace the two that we lost, but all three of those <laughs> young men have done a solid, serviceable job thus far this season. Coach, I want to go back for a second. We, we were talking about Niall Scott, and uh, we did our um, off-season show, uh, you know, halfway through the off-season, and we were looking at some of the uh, combine-type numbers and the 40s and all that, you know, crud that's uh, out there, basically. And he wasn't looking like an exceptional pick if you base it just on the numbers. But then he goes out and gets – he's one of only a couple players, really, from Division Three that gets into that next realm, into the NFL – and, you know, is it the intangibles, do you think? Is it, is, what is it about Niles specifically that you think was, allowed him to get past maybe the lack of a look initially and sort of prop himself up into a position to be, you know, a 49ers pick there, uh, you know, undrafted-wise, and then to the Broncos, et cetera. I heard you talk about his performance with the Broncos, but even go, let's go before that. What was it about Niles that got him to that point? Yeah, hip explosion. The ability to explode through your hips and, and him being able to transfer that from from the practice field uh, to the weight room to, to the game field in a game um the process the entire process frank again was so interesting and so educational for our coaching staff and for our football program 28 of the 32 nfl teams came in here last fall the new york jets came three times which was funny because at mm -hmm. the end they were the ones that had zero interest they were here three times and with, they, they measured the young man and poked and prodded on him so many times that I worried his entire senior season that it was going to affect the way he plays. Now, Niles being as intelligent as, and as mature as he is, and his mother and father did a great job of raising him, he didn't let anything distract him from the task at hand. But we had an NFL scout here every two days every two days for the entire last fall. And that was from the start of camp all the way through the Mount, Un Mount Union game in the quarterfinals. <laughs> and hey, yeah. they measured him 
and they did wingspan. One of the funny way is funny story because it, and I won't say the scout and the team, but they came in. They said, "Heard you got a midget D tackle that we needed to look at," and I went midget, and they said, "Yeah, yeah, you got a short one." I said, "He's six two and five eighths. and they said, "Well, coach, you have to understand that that's short in our league." I said, "Okay." I said, "I've just been looking up at him for four years, so he doesn't seem short to me." <laughs> <laughs> um, but where, where Niles, where Niles got signed at and, and, and yeah, not all his measurables are perfect and him being an NCAA division three wasn't perfect. Cause there's a little bit of a stigma against that as much as I love, yeah. um, D three football and everything the NCAA division three represents there, there's a little stigma that if he was, if he was really good, somebody would have gave him a scholarship out of high school, which is simply not true in a lot of cases, but here's I would, I'll, let me cut to the chase and answer your question. Um, that Niles gets on the bench and benches 410 pounds. And then Niles power cleaning 360 and 365 with no straps. And then Niles squatting 660 pounds. And the speed with which he can bring it down and come back up with it um, is extremely impressive, his hip explosion. And then Niles can go out and run a 4.8 and a 4.9, 40-yard dash. And I forget what Niles brawl jumped, but he, vert he vertically jumped. At 330 pounds, he did 31 and a half inches in the vertical, which lets you know that he can explode and explode and explode. And, and then on top of that, he is a hardworking, humble, smart young man. So, Coach, I want to go back now. This is your fifth season, I believe, uh, with the Bobcats, and you're, you're leaving us and everything. I, I get it. I want to go back, though. We didn't get a chance to talk to you uh, after the Mount Union game last year. And... There's something that happened before the Mount Union game I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about. You, you, on your home podcast uh, that was released, obviously, to the world to hear, but you, maybe you didn't necessarily think that people would have any desire to listen to it, you said a couple things that maybe riled up Mount Union, and some stuff happened even before, in the pregame of that playoff game and whatnot. And it, it may have lit a fire under a team that's always looking for some excuse to get a fire lit underneath them. No doubt about it, because it, you, when you're Mount Union, things get a little boring over there probably week to week, uh, unless Vince uh, lights a fire under them in some way, shape, or form. Vince Karras, that is. What did you learn most from that experience? It, it, Mount Union obviously scored a lot of points against you. You scored a decent amount of points as well. Let's not forget that point, sure. But what did you learn as a head football coach from that experience, and if you get that opportunity again this year, would you do anything differently? First, Frank, after I after I run my mouth for a second, you're going to have to tell me what I said to get them riled up. But the one thing that's come <laughs> up once a month, once a month since that game, the, the one thing that's come up is the way we handled the national anthem. That that it was disrespectful that we stood across the goal line for the national anthem, and you know the the, the word national anthem has become a lightning rod in this country. And, and people have all different sides of it, but everybody is forced to take a side left or right on this national anthem issue. I was so proud of the seniors in our, in our foot, on our football team and in our football program last year because I, I said, what do y'all want to do? How do you want to handle this? I said, and I have one rule and one rule only for you guys, okay? Whatever we do, all 135 of us do together. All 125 players and our 10 coaches were all going to do the exact same thing. And they said, Coach, let's, let's stand and, and let's, re let's respect our military and let's respect our flag. They said, but let, let's don't be boring and stand down the sideline like everybody else. How about we stand across the goal line on what, wherever we come out of the locker room, let's stand across the goal line and salute the flag. And that's what all of us did. I, I, I think with the Mount Union faithful and with Mount Union kind of got a little bit twisted out of it and, and doesn't matter to me, okay? But we had done that all season. We stood across the goal line and, and respected respected our country and respected the flag. And, and here's, we respected our football program in that everybody in our football program did the exact same thing. Now you got to tell me what I said. It was something to the effect of, uh, I think, uh, having uh, your father as athletic director is a nice thing to have uh, at the end of the day. Y'all want the truth? Y'all want me to be politically correct? <laughs> yeah, whatever you want to do. <laughs> We're not trying to get you in trouble, but if you want to say something, I lost my microphone when you said that. i got to put this back on now. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, I don't think Coach is going to pull any punches, Frank. I'm a junior. So, so my father's Delane Fitzgerald Sr. If my father's the athletic director, I win 25 straight national titles. 
I break the all-time record in just about every level. Um, great situation. And, and, and it, it, they can they can be offended by it or not. Great situation. Guys, Larry Karras, great man. A great man, great football coach. And what he's done for that university and for that town is extraordinary. And, and, and diving into it, 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 LK is the reason that there's a lot of jobs in Alliance, Ohio, and he's done a lot of good things for not only the football players that he's coached and been a part of their lives over the last 35 years, but the people in that town. Um, I, I'd, I'd love I, I'd love to be in their situation. Mount Union has the best situation, the best college football situation on any level in the United States. Coach, I, I, I have to say one thing about that. Uh, you know, Vince Karras uh, is a personality, no doubt, and uh, I've had some great experiences with him. I, you know, we've had some less than great experiences with him for a variety of reasons. Larry Karras is somebody that I actually took to early on in my visits to Salem when uh, they were the juggernaut, uh, obviously, of Salem before they moved it down now to Shenandoah. And I always found him to be personable as long as you – Asked him questions that were smart questions. There were some people that would ask him some stupid questions, uh, and he hated it. He hated wasting his time with it and everything else. And I agree with you. I, I actually agree with you 110% that if there's a, fam- a familiar, familial situation at an athletic director to, uh, coach situation, or if the athletic director is the head football coach, which happens, uh, Mike Clark, I think, is listed as such uh, for like homing, for instance, it helps, okay, because you're able to sort of figure out the recruiting scenario a little bit easier and one less uh, naysayer to necessarily go through in those situations. So I, I don't think you said anything wrong. I just think that everybody was looking for a reason to slap at you that week and they found two reasons to do it. The one you pointed out and the one that I uh, refreshed you on here. So um, I still think LK is a quality guy. I think VK, uh, Vince Karras is a great football coach as well. And if you have an opportunity to play them again this year, I want to go see that game personally. I think it's going to be a great game, to say the least. But first, you've got to get through some quality opponents. The beauty, of that. Yeah, the beauty of that is if we get to Mount Union this year, it's been a successful season for us. I hope you the outcome would be sure. a little bit different. You, know, you, you, t- you, you touched on, on Coach Karras and Larry Karras and a, a – Maybe his, maybe him not wanting to deal with dumb questions. Larry Karras is a very smart gentleman, very smart guy. Um, I, I'm, I'm a, I love coaching and I love football and I've researched all these coaches through and through and I've read everything about Larry Karras and everything that Larry Karras ever wrote. Um, the, the week that I took the head coaching job at Southern Virginia ten years ago, the very first thing I read was a write up that Larry Karras had produced on conforming. To your university standards on abiding by what the administration wanted to do and 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 what the town wanted to do and 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 buying in and being that type of person um but but yeah great guy but one of the things that may irritated him is that larry karras is, is so smart he, he may just not want to deal with those type of questions so good guy <laughs> True. Hey, you like to go back yeah. going back 10 or 15 minutes in this conversation talking about research and coaches you brought up the university of albany well, the University of Albany was D3, and then they went D2 for a couple of years, and then they went 1AA. Um, I have read everything I can get my hands on Bob Ford related because Bob yeah. Ford was the head coach and went through all of those changes at the University of Albany. So I kind of wanted to see what he was saying about things and what he went through in their transition so I know what to expect for our transition here. Um, but but make, make no mistake about it because I'll get blown up on Twitter now. Um, and I, I am a fan. I am a fan of what Mount Union has done and what they continue to do. And, and I'll end the whole Mount Union talk with this. And you guys will enjoy this, okay? My dad, Delane Fitzgerald Sr., he has he learned how to pu- push my buttons when I was a young, young man. So I'm at home in Virginia, and it's a week before Christmas, and I'm not doing anything that weekend. He said, come on, son, let's go watch the national title game. Well, I've never been to Salem never been to the national title game always said the only way i was going was if i was playing or coaching he, and i said nah I, i'm gonna take the family out he said no you're gonna go with me to the football game on friday night so my father took me to the national title game last year and i sat on the 45 yard line watched you guys standing down on the field and he made me sit on the 45 yard line in the middle of the mount union people and watch the entire game great experience 
<laughs> you bring up you bring up Bob Ford. You know uh, John Audino, who signed this helmet to me uh, before I stopped broadcasting for Union. Part of that family, Ed Zaloom, uh, former coach of WPI. Part of that family. Numerous, numerous coaches. Part of that family, and uh, Division Three is a much better place because of Bob Ford, and yeah, he ushered them into one AA up there or FCS now. But uh, his imprint is much more on Division Three, and a lot of people don't realize that. And I appreciate you pointing that out because that is the home zone up there for me, as you know. Coach, we could go on for hours and hours with you. You know that. Go I ahead. Got a research project. Research okay. project. Is there more college? Is there more college and pro coaches? that come through the University of Albany or that come through Springfield? Which one would be the most? Or am I leaving out of school that's had more? And I would before we start the research project, there's a dozen, there's a dozen high level college and pro coaches that coached at both either played at Springfield, coached at Albany, or played at Albany, coached at Springfield, or coached at both going through there. Um, but yeah, I've, I always re- researching these coaches, Springfield ties, Albany ties, a lot of them. Not to mention John Cena, but we won't go there uh, from Springfield. <laughs> Coach, thanks so much. I mean, was, yeah, John Cena's quarterback was Kevin Cahill, and then Kevin Cahill is the quarterback's coach at Yale currently, correct? I believe you're That's correct right. on that, That's actually. Right. Look at you. You, you you spend your entire life coaching football. I mean, you've been uh, in the uh, film room. This is Sunday. We're recording this, and you've probably been there since like 6 a.m. if I had to guess with you, and you still little, have the ability. We should put a little comma after Fitzgerald is his PhD at the end, because this, this guy has got a doctorate in football for sure, man. You know, resigning us research projects and all that, but we'll, well, I'm sure this won't be the last time we talk to Coach Fitzgerald this season. They, uh, he's got a great team there in, in Maryland, and I'm sure they're going to be enjoying. A, there's some big games still coming up down the road. Uh, maybe you know we can try to help you find one for this Saturday. If not. You know, worst case scenario, if you you know you win them all, you're you're in a great spot to uh, to get into the tournament, and that's really where what it's all about. Guys, thank you for having me, Frank and James. Hey, first class. Hey, coach, one thing though, one, one favor I got to ask of you. Okay, please don't leave us. Please, come on, just stay, stay a few <laughs> more years, Division Three. We'll go 15 seasons, then you can leave. Okay, come on. I, 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 I love NCAA Division Three football, and I, I wish we could stay. Okay, well, I, I didn't get on my knees at least to uh, beg here, but at the, at the same time, we will miss you. But at the same time, again, uh, we got a few more weeks hey. at least with you, a couple more months. It's only so. week four, Frank. We got a long way to go for this season. <laughs> long way to go. Thanks, Coach. We appreciate it, and folks, uh, stay tuned all week long for a lot more additional content.